Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for our monthly 4D webinar series, first Thursday of every month. Today's webinar is part two of Introducing 4D V14. Today's hosts are Brian Young, Technical Marketing Manager, and myself, Aaron Moeller, Field and Partner Marketing Manager. Brian? Thanks, Aaron. So we're going to try to make this quick for the introduction. We've got a long presentation today. It's going to run over our hour. Uh, we think the presentation will take about 50 minutes, and then after that we're going to take as many questions as we can, probably about 15 minutes worth. Um, if anybody has any questions through the presentation, please put them here into the GoToWebinar questions box. If you're having any technical difficulties viewing our presentation, please put that there as well so we can help you. Great. Thanks, Brian. Our speaker for today is Josh Fletcher, 4D Technical Account Manager. Josh? Okay, so let's get started. Welcome to Introducing 4D V14 Part 2. Today, uh, once again, we're going to be talking to you about 4D V14. The goal of the, this series of webinars has been to point out the kind of the highlight features, the standout features that we have available for you in V14. If you missed the presentation last time, in part, in part one, I talked about the foundational changes that we've made in V14. So features that really kind of go to the core of the product. So for example, there's a new variable type C object. You don't get a new variable type very often in 4D, so that's kind of a big deal. We've added support for SQL views which really closed the loop on security. So you have table level, column level, and row level security in 4D for external access. And then full-time mirroring, which is really all about making sure that 4D is an enterprise class solution, being able to have a mirror going at all times. So if you missed part one, it is uh, available as a video and we will uh, provide a link to that um, later. So today, I'm gonna talk about two other major theme areas in V14. So I talked about the foundation last time. This time I'd like to talk, spend some time talking about maintaining 40 applications and also how we are constantly enhancing that foundation and delivering features that you really want to use to build great applications in 4D. So that's going to be the focus for today. So first I'll talk about maintaining 40 applications and in particular I'm going to talk about three subjects. The first one is troubleshooting. The second one is monitoring, which is um, as compared to troubleshooting, it's what's going on in real time with my running 4D application. And finally, deploying 4D applications. It's certainly an important aspect. Now, the reason why this is a, a major theme of version 14 is we looked at what's happening with our customers as our customers become more successful as your deployments grow either in size or in quantity the ability for you to test and maintain is a big challenge um, there's a there's a gap widening between what you can realistically test and what users are actually doing so just to give you an example, let's say you have a 200 user 4D system. It's very difficult for you to replicate what 200 users might do in a quality assurance environment, in a QA environment, versus what they're actually doing in runtime. The fact of the matter is you can't test everything that users might do. So what we realized is that we need to provide you better tools to efficiently troubleshoot and investigate and maintain these large deployments. And so that's why there's this focus in V14 on maintenance. So it's kind of a course correction in the way we look at how 40 applications are maintained. It's not a 180 degree change. We're not completely changing everything that you can use, but we're enhancing what's there and offering new tools that kind of really focus on uh, this challenge. Okay, so the first thing I'd like to talk about is troubleshooting. Now in a troubleshooting context, you're often trying to deal with a problem that can't be solved immediately. So for example, you might need to turn on some logging. 
And there's lots of different ways to do logging in 4D. There's a different log file types. Um, so number one, you might have multiple different kinds of log files to deal with. Number two, in most troubleshooting situations, you're not gonna solve the problem immediately, so you've gotta do the logging over time. You're gonna have multiple sessions of logging. So you're gonna have this big mound of data to comb through to try to troubleshoot a problem. Now, what, that, what I think that implies is you need to be able to do automated analysis. Um, you need to have the ability to comb through all that data using automated tools and not have to look at it with your eyes. So what are the challenges there? If we look at it, two of the log files from 40, and these are um, from v13, I have the debug log and the request log. One of the first challenges you'll run into if you're trying to use both of these logs to do some troubleshooting is there's no easy way to tie the two logs together. Like if you wanted to know the order of operations, what's happening in the debug log and at the same time what's happening in the request log, that can be difficult. The debug log has a stamp counter, uh, sorry, not a stamp counter, a tick counter for each operation. And the request log has a date and a time. So very difficult to try to draw some correlation between the two logs in v13 or in previous versions. There's nothing to glue them together. So that's one of the things that we addressed in v14. So here again, we've got the debug log and the request log in v14, but what I wanna draw your attention to is that first column. What this is, is a counter. Uh, it's a counter that's shared across different log files. So you can almost think of building an aggregate log. So just to do an example here, in this, these two logs I can see that operation number one occurred in the request log and then operations two and three occurred in the debug log. And finally, operation four was in the request log. So if I'm using analysis tools, log analysis tools, I now have a way to take data from both logs and aggregate it together and get a better picture of what's happening in the application. So that's one of the main challenges that we addressed with logging. So let's look at some other logging enhancements. So we have the log glue, the counter, and the goal is to have that counter across the different log files. Right now it's in the debug log and the request log. Um, the direction is let's make this consistent across all the different log files. Another thing that you'll find is we're trying to focus on a consistent format of the log files. So you'll have consistent headers, uh, consistent use of the tab character to delineate columns of data, the return character or end, end of line, to delineate rows of data, and appropriate escaping. If a log contains text that is, that is data, that is part of what's happening, then we need to handle escape characters effectively because if, for example, you don't escape a return or you don't escape a tab that's part of the data, that's gonna mess up your log formatting. That's gonna make it look like you have new rows or new columns of data. Another feature that we're, uh, the goal to extend across all the logs is the automatic segmentation. So the log files in 4D, when they reach a 10 uh, size, some of them, when they reach a 10 megabyte size, they automatically get segmented um, so that we open up another 10 megabyte chunk. And then you can deal with those 10 megabyte pieces as you see fit. And the goal, of course, is to prevent the disk from being saturated by all this logging data. So you can throw away the older segments if you want, and just keep the most recent ones, and things like that. So we'll find, you'll find that the segmentation feature is gonna be implemented across all the different log files. Now, about the debug log in particular. So we focused on the debug log in particular in v14. And uh, let's look at some of the issues. So first of all, with the v13 debug log, I've got an interpreted one and a compiled one. So just to be clear, it's the same 40 code, but I ran it interpreted and then I ran it compiled. And one of the things that you'll run into, for example, is the, the actual log content is inconsistent. In an interpreted debug log, you'll get the beginning and the, and the end of any project method calls or other method calls. Whereas in the compiled debug log, you don't. Um, that can be troublesome if you're trying to compare if you're debugging, if you're troubleshooting, you might run interpreted, you might run compiled, and you need to be able to compare that stuff. Another thing you'll see in the current debug log is the headers, what would traditionally be considered a header, are actually embedded on every line of the debug log. So in this case, the process ID and then the unique process ID 
um, for processes over time. It, it appears on every line. It's not very efficient. Now, that being said, I do want to point out that there's a reason why the current debug log is structured this way, why the headers appear on every line. There is some advantage to the debug log being human readable. So the current debug log, in a way, is human readable. It's not English, no, but it's something that you can follow along with your eyes. And there is an important reason for that. If you are troubleshooting a crash, you're often only concerned with the most recent or the last entries in a debug log. You're not concerned about all of the accumulated data, but just the most recent things. So having the headers there on the line can be helpful because you don't have to go back and refer to the beginning of the file and figure out which column you were looking at, things like that. Um, you don't need to use an analysis tool to look at it. You can just read it with your eyes. So that's a valid use case. In v14, we wanted to look at a different use case. What if we can use the debug log as an, an automated analysis tool, a code analysis tool, if you will, to be able to turn it on, leave it running in the background, and then go back later and run over it and parse it and see what's happening in the database. And so there's a new format for the debug log in v14. Um, just to be clear, both formats are still available. So this new format was created to be more consistent, more compact. By being more compact, you're able to squeeze more useful information into the same segment. So for example, the headers are no longer there on every line. And in fact, the headers aren't even in the file. You just, you, you know what they are from the documentation. And if you're doing automated analysis, you, you don't need to have the headers in the file. So you have uh, clearly delineated columns of data. You have consistent use of the glue that I mentioned, the counter. You have consistent use of a timestamp, um, things like that. So it's a more compact format. Uh, it's a more efficient format. So it's not designed to be human readable. It's designed for analysis. It's designed for automated analysis. <clears throat> it's designed to be consistent and compact. And now that brings me to an important point, which is if you turn the debug log on in a production system today, and you say you're using V13, it can affect performance. It can drastically affect performance depending on what the database is doing. So traditionally, the debug log isn't something that you turn on and left running, especially in larger systems. This new debug log is designed to be used, designed to be left running. And so there's a new feature in v14, we call it delayed mode, where you can enable the debug log, you can turn on delayed mode, and 40 actually accumulates the log data in memory and only writes it out from time to time. It's not written out in real time. So if you're not troubleshooting a crash, that's fine. It's okay to leave that stuff in memory and just write it out from time to time because you're gonna come back later and do some analysis. And so that's the idea with the new format in v14. So overall, wrapping up troubleshooting, we have a focus on more consistent logging in general to make sure that the analysis of the logs is more effective and easier. And then extending the debug log to be a tool that's useful for code analysis in addition to crash troubleshooting and things like that. All right, next topic that I want to talk about in the context of maintenance is monitoring. And by monitoring, what I'm talking about is looking at what a 40 database is doing in real time. So not doing analysis after the fact, troubles you're gonna crash, things like that, but a basic question. For example, the server is slow, what do you do? Well, in the past, even today, if you're using an older version, you might activate some logging, you might analyze those logs, you might identify something, so you add some debugging code, you deploy an update, you analyze some more debugging logs, lots of different steps that might go into analyzing a performance issue. Or you might call tech support and they're gonna tell you to do all this anyway. Now, what if the problem turns out to be something like you forgot to add an index on a field and that's why it was slow? That would be a lot of work to come to a very basic conclusion. So this is the kind of thing where we want to improve 4D. Things that we can fix. The thing is, you can fix, uh, let me say it differently. You can add an index at runtime. You don't have to do uh, offline analysis. You don't have to fix it in deployment and then deploy an update. 
you can actually add and remove indexes at runtime. So this is actually something you could fix on the fly while users are logged into the system. So that's what monitoring is all about. So hopefully, here we have a familiar dialog. The 40 server administration window, you'll find a new tab on that dialog, a new section called the real time monitor. Okay, let me say first that normally, if a database is healthy and a database is running well, the real time monitor should be blank. The real time monitor is all about identifying those potentially slow operations. So if you don't see anything here, that's a good thing. That means nothing is running slow. But what we did for the webinar is we contrived a problem. We created a problem with a database so that I could show you what it might look like. So here's an example of the real time monitor displaying some information. In this case, it's showing me that there are sequential searches occurring in my database and they are taking a lot of time. Uh, in this case, they've been running for five seconds. Now, the sequential searches are occurring because I don't have an index. I knew that, I created that. But I could fix that at runtime. So in fact, in this particular example, I've got a shot here from later on, where I actually went in and added an index to this field. And there's actually enough data in that field that the indexing operation even popped up in the real-time monitor. So down at the bottom of this list here, you can actually see that there it is building 40s, building the index on that field. Once the index is complete and the, the searches finish, all subsequent searches are gonna use the index and they're fast enough that they're not gonna show up. So they go away. So that's what the real-time monitor is all about. That's the goal of this feature, is to give you a tool to see what the server's doing now and to see what kinds of things you might be able to fix in real time and not have to take the system down and have downtime and things like that. One thing I wanna mention is all the data that you see in the real time monitor is available through a command called get activity snapshot. That command will return uh, a C object. So you can even export it out to JSON text if you want or whatever, but you can manipulate it as a C object. Okay. The last topic in the scope of maintenance is deployment. In particular, as you become bigger, as you become more successful, as you increase the quantity of your deployments, what we're really talking about is automation. What can we do to improve the automation of 4D deployments so that you don't have to have a person there doing the update? The first thing we looked at was the automatic client update. So this is a feature that's actually been in 4D for quite a long time. Um, but we still looked at how we could improve it. And the reason for that really comes down to operating systems. Um, today, the modern operating systems, the new versions of OS X and Windows, they have features like user account control, protected folders, gatekeeper. There's a whole slew of issues that applications have to deal with in order to install themselves on a modern OS. And so that's where this, uh, where this challenge came from and why we looked at this automatic client update. So the fundamental issue with the current automatic client update is that it uses a script. It's either an SH file on Mac or a batch file on Windows. And so I'll give you just a brief idea of what this does. So the automatic client update, it downloads the latest version of the client from the server and then it kicks off this script file. And all the script file really does is it renames the old version so that we can get rid of it. It renames the new version, giving it its proper name, and then it launches and connects to the server. It sounds simple enough, but when you throw in all this OS baggage, it's actually a fairly complex task. So the weakness here is not so much the automatic client update feature, but just the fact that we're using a script file. Scripting languages and script files are very um, difficult to maintain, difficult to work with, don't necessarily take into account the latest OS features and things like that. So in V14, we address this quite simply by replacing that script file with an application. So it's called updater.app on Mac. It's called updater on .exe on Windows. For you, the 40 developer, transparently, it, it does the same thing it used to do before. Um, it renames the old client, it renames the new client, deletes the old client, launches it, connects to the server, all that stuff is still there. The difference for us, the difference for us meaning 40 the company, is that using an application gives us something that's much more robust 
it gives us something that provides much, uh, much more effective error handling and maybe more importantly, much more effective error reporting. So if something does go wrong, we can more easily deal with that. We can report the errors back. Um, there's actually a, you know, a log file for the update. And maybe most importantly, it's something that is appropriate for the future, for moving forward with 40, something that's easier for us to extend, easier for us to maintain. So that's the, the idea there, the auto client updater. Now, <clears throat> client updates are one thing. The feature's actually been there for a long time. But what about updating servers? And this is really the payoff, I think, in v14. The fact is, I don't want to do manual server updates. I want to do auto server updates. I want to automate my server deployment. And we have that in v14. So I'm going to run through um, how it works um, through, through slides, because I think it's easiest to explain it. So I've got a 40 application sitting in my file system and that server is running and I want to do an automatic update. How do I do that? Okay, the first thing you have to do is define an update folder. It's just a folder on the computer, it's your choice, and you just need to tell 40 where that folder is. Now, when you want to do an update, using whatever technology you choose, you need to get the latest server onto the machine, and all of that can already be automated today. So we're not um, we're not reinventing the wheel. If you want to use FTP, you can use FTP. If you want to just do a network copy with a script, you can do that. We're not going to uh, reinvent the wheel for that part of it. That's pretty simple. So you get your new server onto the system. Maybe it's zipped, so you extract it. And now it's sitting there, ready to go. You need to tell 4D where it is. Well, how do we do that? Well, not so fast. First, we need to determine, is the server ready to be updated? Now that can be as simple as just make sure all the clients are logged off, uh, make sure the backup's not gonna kick off, things like that. But there is an important point that I wanna make if you wanna use this feature. And that is, if you wanna do the automatic update, there are some things that you need to move outside of your 40 application. So the reason why I bring this up is in the past, the default, for example, was to have the data file within the server app package. And you can't do that if you want to use the automatic update because you'd lose the data file. So the point is, remove the data file from the package, remove the journal file from the package, remove anything else you might care about within that uh, server package and store it someplace safe on the computer if you're gonna use the automatic update. So I'm not saying do this during the update. This is actually kind of a tangent point. This is just some planning you need to take care of to make sure that the server is ready to be updated. So assuming you've done that, assuming you've made sure all the users are logged off and we're ready to update, how do we actually do the update? So the first thing is there's a new command called set update folder, and that tells 4D where is the new server located, simple enough. And the second new command is restart 4D. Now in addition to the obvious, which is it restarts 4D, this is also what tells 4D, hey, go ahead and check to see if there's any updates pending. So 4D goes and looks, it sees, oh yeah, there's an update pending. Now what we do is we kick off that updater application, the same one that's being used to update the clients. We fire that off and we tell it, here's the new version of the server. And then the running server quits and the updater takes over. So the updater knows where the old server is, it knows where the new server is. So the first things it does is it renames the old server to sort of move it out of the way. It grabs the new server and copies it in place. And then of course, get rid of the old server, kill it with fire, if you will. <laughs> and finally, launch the new server application and you're on your way. Now there's a very important point to make here, which is with this new feature, and because you've moved the data file out of the server package, the automatic update will remember the location of that data file. So in the past you may have dealt with trying to deploy a new version of the server and then you have to choose the data file at startup. With the automatic update feature, you don't have to do that. It'll take care of that for you. So that's pretty cool. Okay, so automatic server update is based basically on two features. Set update folder, tell it where the new server is located, and then restart 4D, which causes 4D to actually go off and do the update. In general, with the deployment, as I said in the beginning, we need to focus on 40 as an enterprise solution 
as your deployments grow, you need to be able to automate as many things as you can. So we improve the automatic client update by using an application instead of a script file. And then we extend that application to allow automatic server updates. And actually, you can use um, that automatic server update for single user applications as well. It's not limited to just 40 server. Okay. So the overall theme, big focus in V14 on maintaining 40 applications. We want to improve the logging to make your troubleshooting more effective. We added the real-time monitor to make real-time analysis more effective. And then, of course, automating the deployment uh, to bring as much automation to the table as we can. OK. So the next theme is all about enhancing. And this is really the 40 tool chest. This is um, the things that hopefully make you excited as 40 developers, the new features that we add every time that uh, make 40 a great product and make it fun to develop with. I have this kind of split up into two sub-themes. One is evolution, so looking at features that evolve over time, and the other is um, kind of a big focus on user experience, and I'll talk about what I mean by user experience in a moment when we, when we get there. Now, the rest of these are Examples built in 4D, so I'm going to switch away from the slides and actually just run through some examples. So I've got a 4D database running here. I want to talk about evolution first. And I think the classic example of what I'm talking about in terms of evolution is ListBox. ListBox is a feature that's been in 4D for quite some time. It's been improved with every release. We've talked about it every year at the summit, so I don't want to um, you know, beat a dead horse and talk about ListBox again, but there are some cool new features in V14 with ListBox. But the point that I want to make is I think this is very much reflective of the kind of continuous integration, continuous improvement development style that we are taking on with 40. A feature is added to the product and then continually improved. It's not just forgotten about. So ListBox, I think, is a classic example. So I'll just talk about um, a couple of new features with ListBox. So first of all, I've got a ListBox here on the screen. Um, you know, it's, a, a, it's got some data. As I click around, you can see what appears to be a cell highlight happening. Now, it's not a cell highlight in the traditional sense of a spreadsheet, but what it really is, is there's a new command called ListBox set row color. And that command allows you to actually specify the column. So what we're basically doing is changing the background color of a column at a row position and the foreground color as well. And we can do things like make the text bold, make the text underlined and italic. And that's done with a second command, which is listbox set row font style. So two new commands that let you do some pretty cool stuff. Let's look at another example here. So what I have here is another list box with a bunch of data. However, the data is too big to fit in the list box. And the first thing I want to point out, and this is just kind of a freebie, if I resize this window, you see there's an ellipsis that appears in the center of some of that data. That's just free and built into V14. You don't have to do any special coding for that. It, it does it automatically for you. But I have a row height here that's certainly high enough that I should be able to see all of this data. So what I really want to do, and I've got a hint down here at the bottom of the screen, I want to do a word wrap. So in V14, list boxes now support word wrap. So as I resize this window, you'll see that the text flows the way we would expect. I do want to point out something that's kind of cool is the when it wraps a word, it doesn't break the word in the middle. It's using our keyword algorithm to determine which pieces are words, and then it, it wraps appropriately. It wraps based on keywords instead of just some arbitrary thing. So, uh, so how do you do word wrap? That is a object property. So select the column of a list box, and there's a new property called word wrap, and you just check it or uncheck it depending on whether or not you want to support word wrap in that column. Okay. That's it for list box. Next uh, area that I want to talk about, no pun intended, in the context of evolution is the web area. Now, hopefully you're aware, even if you're not using it, that the web area is a pretty amazing tool. We've shown a lot of demos over the last several years in, in summits and things like that about all the different things you can do with web area, uh, whether it's mashups, whether it's building hybrid interfaces, things like that. 
So today, I, I actually, I don't want to talk about what you can do with web area. What I want to talk about is developing with web area, because what we focused on in V14 is improving the development process with regards to web area, streamlining the development process. So not so much what can you do with it, but how easy is it, how easy is it to work with? It's very important, I think. So first of all, what you've got on the screen here is a 40 interface with some 40 form objects at the top, a drop down list and a button, a web area on the left, it's currently displaying a chart, and then a list box on the right. So I've got this web area on the left, it's displaying some financial data. I have a, a range of years that I can choose and then it, it draws out the, uh, the data for those years. So the first thing, how am I getting data into this chart? Now that's not actually uh, a new feature. The way you do that is there's a command called wa execute JavaScript function and it allows you to pass data, well it allows you to call a JavaScript function within the web area. In this case, we're calling a function that's create chart and allows you to pass data into that function call. The difference in v14 is what you pass. So in the past, you were limited to text. You could stick numbers in there, but they came in as text. In v14, we can pass a C object. So we have this new object type. It's JSON under the hood. That's perfect for a web environment. So I'll turn on the types here so you can see what I'm passing in. So I've got a C object. There's the raw JSON text, and the debugger actually understands C objects, so it's actually split it up also uh, to show me the different values that are being passed. So that's one new thing is I can pass C object into the web area. So let me run this, and the chart gets drawn, but now what? And so that's the next new feature is once I've passed off my 40 data to that JavaScript function, what if something goes wrong? How do I debug it? Now, if you're a web developer, you know that in a browser, you have development, you have debugging tools built into the browser for you to inspect what's happening. And that's what we've added in 40v14. We've added the inspector. So I'll go ahead and turn on the inspector in this web area. Because I've got kind of a small screen here, it's, it squeezes down, but I can actually pop this out and interact with it. So the inspector, if you're not a web developer, don't fret. The inspector is very much like the 40 debugger. So I'll show you a couple of examples here. So I'm going to turn on debugging for this page. And then I'm going to locate my script that's rendering the pie chart. Now, if you remember when I showed you the 40 trace window, I was calling a JavaScript function called create chart. So I'm going to go ahead and set a breakpoint within this HTML file on that function. I'm going to go back to 40. I'll select a different year range just so we can have it change. And the chart actually got rendered and now, because of that breakpoint, I'm actually debugging the web area using the inspector. So I've stepped from a 40 context into a web area context and being able to debug. So there's the create chart function. Here's the data object that I passed from 40. And of course, we can see the values that are being passed in. That right there is pretty dang cool. Now, the inspector is very much like the 40 debugger. For example, there's uh, this tab called console which is very much like the 40 expression window, the custom expression window. So I can type data, for example, and that's the data object that I passed from 40, and there's the values. So that's um, a piece of what the inspector is all about. It makes it much easier to debug in your development of the web area. I'm gonna go ahead and turn off this breakpoint, and I'm gonna set a different breakpoint and talk about something else. Let's go ahead and run this code and then come back to 40. So there's this, actually, you know what? Let me turn that breakpoint off one second. There's a second feature in this dialog. So they've got this pie chart here, but what I can actually do is I can click on a pie piece and it goes off and it fetches some 40 data into a list box. And it also takes that color that was in that pie piece and, and displays it in the list box. So how am I doing that? In other words, I'm clicking on a web area, but I'm causing something to change within 40. And that's another new feature in v14. So I'll set a breakpoint down here, and then I'll click on the pie piece again. So now I'm debugging. And what I want you to notice is there's a JavaScript object in this file called $40. That is an object that 40 creates for you in the web area automatically, 
and among other things, that object allows you to directly call 40 project methods that have that have been exposed, that have been shared. So $40.capitalization by year is actually calling a 40 method. And it's passing in two parameters, the year, 2013 in this case, and a color, whatever that color happens to be. So that's JavaScript calling back into 4D. So as I run this code, I'm going to open up the 4D debugger. So now I've stepped from web area back into 4D. And here's the method, capitalization by year, opened in the debugger. And as I step over the code, there's the two parameters, dollar $1. I'll put it in the, debug, in the expression pane so we can see. There's 2013 and dollar $2. There's that color being passed into 40 from the web area. We call that kind of generically the, the uh, web area callback in 40v14. So we run that. I'll go ahead and uh, pop my inspector back in and then uh, close it. Actually, I think I need to, oh no, the break, breakpoint's gone. Okay, so what are the three things that are new that we saw here in v14? Number one, you can pass C object into the web area. That's very efficient because um, this charting library here is called jqplot. A lot of the JavaScript libraries you'll find expect JSON anyway, so the fact that we can pass C object is, is very advantageous. We have the web area inspector that allows us to debug what's going on in the web area. And then the, we have the web area callback, which allows us to, by clicking or interacting with the web area, call directly into 40 and make things happen. So overall, I hope you can see the focus in D14 was on streamlining the development with the web area. Okay. Another one in the subject of evolution is the styled text object. So I'm going to open up a dialogue here. We're actually going to talk about this dialogue later on. So I'm just going to click down through some of this UI. And I would like to send an email to this guy, Mr. Ray Burris. So this big blank area down at the bottom of this interface is actually a styled text object. And there's a few new features um, that I want to talk about. So I think the general point here is styled text object is kind of on the same path as ListBox, where it's been in the product for a couple of releases. We're constantly improving it. We added, we've at, we're adding a few more improvements here in v14. And um, I'll show you what these are. OK, so I'll get a template here of the email I would like to send to Mr. Burris. Now, being a database developer, I got a database application. I want to send this guy an email, but I don't want to type in the email. Why would I do that? I have the data. I don't want to type in his name. I don't want to type in his company name. Why would I want to type any of that in when I already have the data? So the style text object in V13, I'm uh, sorry, in V14 has support for expressions. So I've actually toggled the display here so you can see the expressions that have been inserted in this style text area. So I've got field references, I've got an interprocess variable, a few more interprocess variables down at the bottom. So any 40 expression can be inserted. Uh, for example, I'll go ahead and insert, let's say, the current date at the top of the message. So there's current date expression. I can switch. There's the date being displayed as opposed to the expression. Um, toggling between the two is just a command. It's, it's, it's nothing, nothing really fancy. So the ability to insert expressions is one feature in v14. I'm going to insert something else, which is a URL. But as I'm doing that, I want you to note something. So down here at the, the company, I'm going to right click to insert something. That's actually new. Support for the on click event in the style text object is also a new feature in v14. And since it's there, I can open a menu, pop it up, and insert some stuff. Now, I'm going to insert a URL. That's actually a little bit different than expression. It's a separate command. So anyway, I can put in, you know, www.40.com. And the way it behaves in the style text area is probably what you would expect. It's blue. You can click on it. It'll open up a browser and go to that page. So expression inserting, uh, support for the on-click event, and the ability to insert URLs also is uh, the, the three features for style text object. OK. now. Since I'm sitting here in an, inter in an email interface, I actually want to take a moment to talk about email. So uh, I got another template here. Make sure I grab the right one. That's the wrong one. Uh, yeah, OK. When I say email, obviously, 
or hopefully, obviously, I'm talking about 40 internet commands. So there's the 40 internet commands plugin has a, a set of SMTP commands for sending email. So the first thing is, and I'll go ahead and uh, open up a preview of this email instead of looking at the source. So what you see in this email is English, French, German, and Japanese. The point is 40 internet commands now supports UTF-8. So UTF-8 in the subject, UTF-8 in the body. That's great. So you can have all the different character sets embedded in the email that you need. Now, this is something maybe a little bit more esoteric, but bear with me. You can see that this email contains an image. It contains the 40 logo. The rounded corners you see up at the top are actually also images. And the fact is, it's an HTML email. This is not plain text, obviously. So if you want to do this kind of email, you have to do what's called a multi-part email. Multi-part emails, if you ever look at the source of one, are kind of a huge mess. So with multi-part, you have a plain text version, you have an HTML version, and if you're embedding images like we are here, you have to encode and attach those images and use the, the correct uh, formatting to refer to them. So it's a whole bunch of, it used to be, or if you're not using V14, it's a whole bunch of manual work to build a multi-part message. The great news in V14 is that's all automatic. The HTML and plain text versions are automatically created for you. The SMTP attachment command understands how to attach an embedded image, and then you can refer to it in your email body. So all of that has been automated for you in V14. That's, that's really cool, I think. Okay, so that wraps up evolution. Kind of a, uh, a highlight of the features that have continually involved with each 40 release. Now I want to talk about user experience. Now when I say user experience, that's actually a term in the industry with some weight. Um, I'm not just using the two words user experience arbitrarily. So you may already be aware of this, but just bear with me. User experience is the idea that user interfaces should be geared towards uh, making the user's experience a good one and not a bad one. So it's not just about building a GUI. It's about analyzing what users are doing and adjusting the GUI to support the tasks that they're trying to accomplish. So that's just a very small nutshell description of user experience. So this next set of features that I want to talk about kind of speak to that. How can we make 40 applications enjoyable to use uh, and not just a GUI kind of a thing? So the first thing I'll talk about um, is the ability to save form geometry. So we can provide in 40 interfaces the ability for the user to change the layout of the form. So in this particular form, I've got splitters. I can resize the panes that are here. I've got a list box where I can drag and drop the columns. So the point is I've done some work to lay this out the way I want it. But if I close it and open it back up by default, all that work is lost. That's very disrespectful to the user. That does not respect the effort the user made to lay that thing out the way they wanted it to be. Now you can solve that in 40 with a lot of code. You can track the changes that they made and resize things every time you open the form. It's a lot of work. The great thing about V14, and I'll show you, is it's not really much work at all. So let me open this form up. So here's the form. I want to save the changes the user makes to that form. It's as simple as going over to my form properties, turning on the checkbox, save geometry. I'll save this form, I'll close it. I'll switch back to application mode and open it back up again. I'm gonna resize all these things to make it really obvious that they've been changed, even though you probably would never want the interface to look like that. And I'll reorder the columns. I'll close this window open it back up, and all of my changes are persisted. So that's what save form geometry is all about. It's built in, you don't have to write any code, it's just a checkbox in design mode. All right, next one I wanna talk about. So here is a 40 form with a layout within there that maybe looks like a brochure or something you might print. Now you can build something like this today with SVG, you can build it with images, you can build it with web area, a lot of different ways to do it. But this one you're looking at is actually just a 40 form. And in particular, what I want to point out is this vertical text that's over on the left. It's not a picture, it's not SVG, it's just a 40 text variable. 
So the point is, there's a new feature in V14, which is the static text orientation. So you can orient the text vertically or horizontally. So this is one application of that feature, just kind of a, a brochure layout, but maybe something more interesting for runtime. So I'll go ahead and close that. So here I have an interface, a list interface, but it might be, well, it is. it would be too wide to print, right? If I scroll over here, I've got a lot of columns. I wouldn't be able to fit that on a single page. Well, with the text orientation, I could introduce a printable size just by orienting the column names vertically. Now I can fit it all within one page very easily. So it's kind of a, a basic, a simple feature, but with some pretty interesting ramifications. Now the way you control it, the way you do this, you have two ways. There is uh, an orientation property in the inspector for each, uh, for text objects. There's also a command object set text orientation. So either way, you can control that. Okay, let's look at another one. So there's a new event in V14 called on picture scroll. So in this interface, I'm actually dragging the scroll bars for the picture on the left and synchronizing it with the picture on the right. Now that's just a basic example so you can understand the principle. Let's look at another implementation. So on the left now, I've got kind of a zoomed out view, but with a gray box, oops, where I can drag it around and zoom in and show the zoomed in view on the right. Now you could do that today. That's not the interesting part. Because of the on picture scroll event though, I can scroll the picture on the right using the scroll bars and then update the gray box on the left because there's an event, I can trap it, and I can use that to set the position. So that's pretty cool. Another uh, item related to pictures. So you know probably that if you have a, a picture variable and you drag from one picture variable over to another picture variable, you get this little ghost image that's automatically created for you by 4D. So depending on what you're dragging, you get a representation of what you're dragging. So in this case, I've got listings of different laptops and I can drag the pictures over. But what if that listing is not pictures? What if it's text? Well, the default behavior when you drag text is really nothing. You get an icon indicating that it can be drag and drop, but that's it. There's no picture or anything like that. We have a new feature in 40v14, a new command called set drag icon that gives you complete control. So even though I'm dragging text, I can set the drag icon to be a picture. And I don't even have to make it a different picture for each row, I can make it the same picture. I, I have complete control as the developer with set drag icon. Okay. One more here for you. So there's a, a new command called object set data source. Now what I want you to think about is when you're in design mode and you add an object to a form, you set a variable name. What you're doing effectively is you're setting the data source of that variable. You're telling 40, where is the value for this object on the screen going to come from? And you can, you've been able to do that in design mode, of course. But what about being able to do that at runtime? And that's what objects at data source is all about. So on the left, I've got a text, a time, and a date, and a long. And on the right, I've got my generic variable. And with objects at data source, I can actually change the data source of that variable and have it show up. So to be very clear, I am not copying data from one object to another. I'm simply changing the data source so the value automatically gets populated over. And if I change the data in one side of this equation, the change shows up on the other side automatically. It's not copying, it's actually referring to the same object. So I think that demonstrates the principle. But what is this for? And I think this is really all about dynamic interfaces. So dynamic interface means interface that's built at runtime. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add several fields to this little interface that you see here. Now, creating objects dynamically, you've been able to do for quite a while. Then we added object duplicate, where you could actually set the data source at the time of creation. But the one thing you haven't been able to do is set the data source after the fact, set the data source at runtime. So now that I've created these objects, I can actually assign them to fields at runtime, no problem. Put in the country. And these are real field references. If I scroll back and forth through the data, it's actually loading the data for the next record and the previous record and so on. 
So object set data source allows me to at any point assign the data source of a form object. Okay. So let me switch back to the slides. That didn't work. <laughs> okay. And what I want to do is kind of summarize everything that you've just seen. So with evolution and list box, I showed you styled cells and word wrap. There's actually a couple other features that I didn't show you, but you have the ability to programmatically move a column, for example. And we have support for standard actions with list boxes. So if you scroll to the end of the list box, the last record button would disable and things like that. The web area, big focus on development, streamlining the development. So support for C object to pass in data, the web area inspector, so you can see what's going on in the web area, and then the callback mechanism, so you can call back into 4D, making it much easier for a web area to inter interact with 4D. The styled text object, of course, has the expression and URL support, as well as on click. And just an FYI, if you've used styled text object in the past, all of the commands are now prefixed with ST. And the last one for evolution, with internet commands and emailing, you have UTF-8 support, you have automatic multi-part messages, and you have the ability to do automatic inline attachments as well. On user experience, I showed you kind of a whole bevy of features that are really focused on allowing you to build interfaces that are gonna make a pleasurable experience for your users, hopefully. So the ability to save form geometry automatically, the ability to set the text orientation and so on, you just saw these. Now what I wanted to do to wrap up those two topics, the evolution and user experience, um, is really leave you with something that kind of pulls it all together. So this is that dialogue that I was talking about earlier. And I'm gonna go ahead and open up one of these records first. So what this dialogue is, is kind of an amalgamation of all the different features I've just shown you. For example, on the left-hand side, that's a web area. On the top, the breadcrumb is also a web area. So as I scroll back and forth through the records, this web area is being updated using JSON. If I click in the web area, so I'm gonna click on all, that'll actually take me back up out of that individual record and into my list. So in other words, clicking in a web area, but having 4E respond using the callback mechanism. With list box cell styling, I'm coloring the rows. So investors are red, advisors are, are teal, uh, placement agents are orange. I can color those rows and I can see you know different categories. And the last one on the right hand side here um, is a, a tab that the user can collapse. So the idea is if it's taking up too much real estate, they can collapse this down, but I still want to indicate the tab is there. So I can use the static text orientation to indicate that, hey, there's still some UI over here and you can switch between these different things. And then of course, with the same, the, the saving the form geometry, I could save whether or not uh, it's expanded or collapsed. So I think this is just an example of the kind of level of user interface we can deliver in V14, combining all these different technologies together. Okay. The fact is, even though you just saw a bunch of E14 features, that's not everything. <laughs> There's a lot. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna quickly go through a few more highlights. We always add new getters and setters in each version of 4D, each new release of 4D. So, for example, you can set the action of objects at runtime with object set action. You can set the style sheet if you wanna do styling at runtime. Placeholder is kind of an interesting one. So if you have a, if you imagine a search field where you have a clue for the user what they should type into that search field, it's like gray text in the background, that's what placeholder is for. Now, I've shown you a few getters and setters in the demonstrations and in these three getters and setters here. In fact is the list of new getters and setters in V14 is quite large. So there is even more. I'm not gonna go through each one of these, but just to be aware. There's a whole bunch more. So we're driving towards that goal of being able to get and set anything that you can set in the form editor to also be able to get and set at runtime. And even more features beyond that. Now this list I think is maybe a set of niche features that are not necessarily important to everybody uh, in the 4D community, which is why we didn't highlight them, but they may be important to a subset, like for example, support for HTTP client certificates. That's very important in some contexts. Um, 
things like the on host database event. So that's a new database event for component developers so that your components can actually have startup, startup code that's called by the host. So there's a lot of stuff like that out there as well. So just kind of to whet your appetite, um, if you're interested in some of these features, make sure and go check them out. Okay, so despite how quickly it may have gone, that's the end of our time for the presentation. We'll go ahead and answer as many questions as we can. Thank you very much for watching and give us just a moment to get ready for your questions. Thank you, Josh. We have some updated summit information for you that we'll be sending out in the webinar survey email following the webinar today. Uh, it will contain a link for you to reserve your hotel room at the host hotel, the Marriott Riverwalk. Just a reminder, the buses for the evening with 4D party will only pick up and drop off at the Marriott Hotel. So please reserve your room now. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, that River Rock really seems like to, the place to be there. I can't wait. So uh, these webinars, we've now we're now turning into a regular monthly series, and uh, so next one is going to be March 6, one month from now at 9:30. So the first Thursday of every month, uh, expect to be uh, seeing these announcements go out. Now the next webinar is really important. We really want everybody to show up for this. Josh? Yeah. So the next so we we've already uh, published a video about the new journaling features in V14. So the next webinar is not about the new features. The next webinar is about the impact and about how you need to prepare um, to move to V14, how you need to prepare to continue doing journaling. So it's actually, I think, important for everyone. So tell your friends. We're going to be pushing really hard to get as many people into that webinar as possible and make everybody aware of the, the work that needs to be done. So we look forward to seeing you there. Okay, first Thursday of every month. See you in March. Now for the q and A, I'll leave this up there. If you have any questions that occur to you after we're done, please send them to webinar at 4D.com. We're compiling all the questions and we'll send those out with answers uh, in a few days. Uh, we, uh, we do have a survey email coming out. We really want your feedback to make sure we're doing the best we can to make these things useful for you. Okay, I'd like to introduce Ad, our Director of Technical Support, and Josh for the Q&A. So just so everybody knows, all those examples that you saw during the presentation were built by Ad. So if you love them, Ad gets all the credit, and if you hate them, Ad still gets all the credit. <laughs> So we are going to go through and, and try to answer as many of your questions as we can. Um, if we run out of time, we will still get written answers as well. And like Brian said, those will be sent over to you. Um, so without further ado, let me go back up here. Do you have one already, Ed? Okay. Somebody asked um, about, well, a couple of people asked about the real-time monitor and about what kinds of information, besides what I showed you, which is a, just a sequential search, uh, what kind of information you might be able to see in the real-time monitor? What other kinds of information? And I think the easiest way to define that is any of those messages that you might have seen on a client, like a backup in progress or a sequential search or an index being loaded or all of those different things that you might see that get opened by 4D, are going to be consolidated and displayed in the real-time monitor on the server. So you'll be able to see all that information on the server as well. Um, that's sort of phase one, and that's already there. Of course, we plan to enhance that real-time monitor over time and evolve it and add more features and add more information. Um, the goal is to be able to see as much as you can on the server. Um, regarding the saving from changes, um, now the question is, is that specific for the, the user? It's actually specific for um, workstation and application. Uh, if you're making changes uh, while you are to the form, um, and then um, you lock out, and you lock in as a new user, uh, it's actually um, reusing the same. So it's per machine, per machine, probably per operating system user. Right. So if you log into the OS as the same guy, you're going to get the same setting. Right. Okay. Um, someone asked about the automatic update feature and uh, what happens if there are running processes. So <clears throat> it's an important. I think that's an important question because it, it maybe means that I didn't explain the feature very well. You have control 
of the automatic update. The automatic update does not happen until you tell it to happen. So if there are background processes, you're in control. You can, you can shut down those background processes and then do the automatic update. Or if you don't want to do the automatic update, then don't. It's completely up to you. Um, once the update is happening, of course, 4D does it for you. But to actually kick the thing off, that's up to you. You, you have control as the developer. Uh, another question related to the automatic update. Um, can you reconnect clients uh, while after the update occurs? I guess there's two ways to answer that. There's not necessarily an automatic way. Let, no, let me put it a different way. Say a client is already connected, and you go to restart. So the client's going to get booted off. That client is not going to automatically reconnect through some 4D feature. But of course, there's ways to automatically launch clients. This particular question was asking about slave client machines or 40-based web servers. So in other words, a client session that's running but doesn't have a user sitting in front of it, there's automated ways to restart that that it is now. You don't have to have V14 to do that. So I don't want to go off on too much of a tangent, but I think you can solve that problem today. Now there's a question about um, can you set the data source to the list box. Um, now, the list box right now, um, you can already um, um, set the data source. This, this is in the context of the object set the object, data source command. Right. Okay. Now, the object set data source command is specific to um, uh, a one level object um, such as the variable and all those stuff. Now, list box is a little different. Um, the command does not work with the list box, but you can already do that part already inside the list box. You can destroy the column. You can uh, reinsert the column with the specific um, um, target of the data source. By the way, somebody asked how many attendees we had today. It looked like we got up to about 130-ish, something like that. Um, uh, I thought there was one more about, oh, save form geometry. Can you turn it on, on and off programmatically? I don't think you can, right? Turn it off in the language. No, no. Yeah. So safe form geometry it, right now is design time only. Right. And oh, and I didn't, I forgot to mention when I was presenting, um, safe form geometry can be applied to the entire form or also per object. It doesn't have to be the entire form. Um, <clears throat> there's been quite a few questions about, um, I think basically leading towards deeper explanations of some of these features. Um, you know, will there be more examples? Will there be more presentations? And that's certainly the goal. The first two webinars we did here on V14 were really just to highlight what we thought were the main features that would be available for you to be interested in using V14. Right. We'll have more content, of course, over the coming year, be it tech notes, be it tech tips, be it further webinars, whatever. Somebody asked. Let me. Let me. Let me. Somebody asked, "How come there was no info about the new query editor?" <laughs> that was actually the part one. The part one webinar did the new query editor. So if you missed part one, I forgot to tell you to put a link in here. The the first oh, webinar yes. that we gave has actually already been published. It's yeah. available on our YouTube channel. Go ahead. Brian. Yeah. Excuse me, Josh. Um, it's going out in the email that we are sending oh. out today. I, I believe it's oh. there. Oh. Okay. Sorry. Um, I thought you already sent it. But it did, well, it, it, it did go out to the previous attendees. Gotcha. Okay. So it's already been published. The previous attendees have that link. But yeah. you're also going to send that link again today. Yeah, yeah okay. we'll get it in there so you can see the, the, the YouTube channel. OK, cool. Um, now, there's a few questions regarding to the demos. Um, right now, uh, the demos are fully integrated with uh, uh, a big database. Now, what we really want to do um, coming up in the future is that break them up into separate parts that we can focus on more detailed information about the features. We'll release those as a tech note as we go along. I think um, you'll find it to be a lot more useful than just you know send out the, the big tech uh, big database. Okay. Um, Somebody asked, and this is a good question, I missed the beginning, was this recorded? So all of these webinars, we're going to make sure and record, and we're going to make sure and post them um, so you'll be able to come back and watch them. And I think that's going to be super important for the next one, um, the, the, the one about preparing for journaling. So even if you can't attend the live webinar, you'll be able to come back and watch it. Um, 
there's a couple questions about like you know when will we have a 64-bit OS 10 server and things like that. Today we really want to focus on questions just about the webinar and and I'm sure you know we can't really discuss uh, upcoming features publicly anyway. The best way to find out what's coming is to make sure you're in the partner program because you have access to betas and stuff like that. Um, all right. Uh, how do you reset the form geometry to the original sizes? If I remember correctly, it's, a, it's just the well, window. It's, go ahead, Ed. Sorry. I think that's a, it, by default, uh, in order for you to utilize those features, um, um, the calls that you make to, um, to open the windows, um, you have to enable the, the option to save the, the windows location, uh, which is, I think, the last parameter, the star parameter. Now, um, you can reset it. Um, just this is sort of a trick um, during a runtime is to make it another call to open the windows without the, the parameters. Everything will get um, restored back to where it's supposed to. Now, it means that the next call that you're going to have to make is the one that with the star parameter in order for you to uh, allow the user to make changes and save the, those changes. Okay. This is a really good question. Um, Somebody, uh, so the question is, I got the impression that 40 server was going headless, but now you've added more with the real-time monitor. What's the feature plan? So I want to say the real-time monitor appears in the existing server administration window. The existing server administration window can be opened on a client. So even if the server goes headless, you'll still have access to that administration window on a client. Um, so. In, in my opinion, the, the, the future plan remains the same. They certainly are trying to remove all the carbon code from the server and make it so it can eventually run on Linux and all that kind of stuff. Those are like, you know, not, not certainly not committing to that, but that's the idea. Um, but the user interface itself is still going to be useful even from a client. And don't forget that the information that you see in the real-time monitor is also available from the language, so you can even access it without any use, user interface at all. Um, can we have a video link to this webinar? We will definitely be sending out a follow-up email that has uh, the video link. Okay, uh, so it looks like, I think we've got most of them covered here. Let's oh, see, actually, how much yeah. time do we have? Okay, I'm still looking over the list here. Um, I think there's more questions coming in here that I think we've already we answered in the context in the in the course of answering previous questions. So that's why it's taking us a little bit more time. Um, there's a bunch of so I guess I would like to to address this one more time. There's a bunch of questions about safe form geometry, but the questions being asked are sort of mixing up I think an old feature which is um, user editable forms. Those are two no. completely different things. No, it's, it's yeah. save, um, save the location of the windows. Uh, of, of the windows where, where you, let's say if you open the windows and then you move it, the next time you close it. No, no, no. I, sorry. Yeah. But I think there's a couple of questions here that make me think that people might be thinking of the, the old user editable forms where a user could change the position of form objects, oh. and those those changes were saved in a 4DA file on the server. Right. That's a totally different feature. The safe form geometry that we're talking about is not about the user being able to rearrange a form, but there are certain objects within 4D, like a splitter, like a checkbox, Sizing. like a, a hierarchical um, tree view, where you might have expanded and collapsed trees. There's all these different pieces of form UI that have a state associated with them. So I'm not talking about a position, an absolute position like in the form properties, but rather the state of something. Is it collapsed? Is it expanded? Is it checked? Has the splitter been moved? That's what the save form geometry is all about. It's, it's different than the old user editable forms. Now, the implied question though is where is that information saved? I actually don't know. <laughs> so that's something we can follow up on unless you know. Well, it's actually right. saved um, not don't know exactly with the location, but yeah. it's definitely on the workstation that yeah. you're on. Uh, yeah. It's per workstation and uh, per the user profile, that is. So, I mean, if you log into the machine uh, as a particular user and you happen to log into 40 application um, with user A, for example, 
Now, you can make changes. You can log out. While you're still logging into the machine as the, uh, the same user, if you re-log in as another user to the database, you can still be using the same, inf um, you know, uh, for us, the, the setting that you apply earlier. Now, if you log out uh, from the machine and you log back in as another user, for example, now you re-log in to 4D database. This time, it's going to save the information at a different um, as a different user now. So again, it's it's con conjunction between um, the the user, the system user, and the workstation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, thank you everybody for coming. I think that uh, first of all, sorry for getting started a little bit late. So we've made sure we stayed a little bit longer here to answer your questions. If uh, if there's any questions here that we didn't uh, make it through, we'll make sure and uh, have written answers that get sent out to you. And if you have more questions, like Brian said, go ahead and email them to webinar at 40.com. And I'll see you guys in a month. I'll let these okay. guys take back. Th thank you, Josh. Thank you, Ad. Um, I'm going to go and send that email out. Uh, there's a lot of questions about the previous uh, webinar, and you'll get that link very soon. And uh, please let us know what you think. Thanks for coming.